Welcome to the Long March Forward for Voting Rights. I'm Margaret with Civic Nebraska's Voting Rights Team. Today we're looking at the struggle of Native Americans to obtain and exercise their right to vote. The relationship between indigenous people and the American colonists was so contentious with no cooperation between states on a unified policy. Based on this history, the very first article of the newly formed nation's constitution endowed Congress with the sole power to negotiate with tribal nations. While the ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868 was drafted to protect the voting rights of black men, it simultaneously disenfranchised nearly all Native Americans, as it granted citizenship only to Native American men that paid taxes. This was challenged right here in Nebraska in 1880 when John Elk of the Winnebago Nation attempted to register to vote in Omaha. His request was denied by the Register of Voters in the Fifth Ward, Charles Wilkins. Elk sued and his case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. He argued that as he had renounced his tribal allegiance in compliance with the Citizenship Clause, he is a U.S. citizen and entitled to all rights and privileges as stated in the 14th Amendment, which states, all persons born of naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Elk urges the court that this applies to his voting rights as well. In 1884, the court ruled against John Elk with Justices Harland and Woods dissenting. Harland wrote, if he did not acquire national citizenship on abandoning his tribe and becoming by residence in one of the states, subject to the complete jurisdiction of the United States, then the 14th Amendment has wholly failed to accomplish in respect of the Indian race what we think was intended by it. And there is still in this country a despised and rejected class of persons with no nationality whatever, who born in our territory, owing no allegiance to any foreign power and subject, as residents of the states to all the burdens of government, are yet not members of any political community, nor entitled to any of the rights, privileges, or immunities of citizens of the United States. The court finds Elk to be foreign born, although he was born in Nebraska. Other foreign births of note are Thomas Paine and Alexander Hamilton. It would take 60 years for Native Americans to become naturalized citizens in 1924 with the passage of the Native Citizenship Act, also called the Snyder Act. Be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that all non-citizen Indians born within the territorial limits of the United States be, and they are hereby declared to be citizens of the United States. Another 40 years would pass before com full compliance was achieved in all 50 states. For example, in 1948, the Arizona Supreme Court struck down a constitutional provision that barred Native Americans from voting. It took Utah until 1962 to extend voting rights to Native Americans. States continue to create new barriers and obstacles to prevent indigenous Americans from voting. Arizona used literacy tests until 1970. In 2008, the Alaska government eliminated polling locations for Alaska Native villages in a district realignment that resulted in voters having to travel by plane to reach their polling locations. As recently as 2016, the U.S. Supreme Court rejected an appeal on behalf of Native American and rural voters in South Dakota against a restrictive voter ID law that excludes P.O. boxes as legitimate addresses. With me today is a special guest, my mother, Jane Marsh. We are members of the Cherokee Nation. Mom, can you tell us, what does voting mean to you? Well, I'll tell you a little background. In 1955, uh, I was a student, a senior at Hastings College, and uh, I was engaged to your father. Uh, uh, I, my roommate was also engaged to a young man from Thailand. Well, she had heard that they were, that there was an anti-miscegenation law in Nebraska, so she went down to the courthouse to find out about it, and I went along. And as you know, as you've said, we, uh, I'm three-eighths uh, Cherokee. Uh, well, she, found her, she asked the judge, and he looked up the statute. The statute read, no white person may marry a person who is more than one-fourth Negro, uh, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, or other undesirable. 
And so uh, her husband, since to be, since he was none of those, it was fine, she could marry him. And I said, now wait a minute. Are you telling me, I'm, I'm three-eighths Cherokee, are you telling me I can't get married in this state? And the judge said, not unless you marry another Indian. Well, I wasn't planning to get married in Nebraska anyway, but I was a little offended at being undesirable. Um, and I had a, a friend at, uh, at Hastings College. Her name was Helen Hirano, and her family had been moved to the relocation camps near North Platte, Nebraska when, uh, during the war. Uh, she had a younger brother who also went to Hastings College, and he ran into the same problem. He wanted to marry a white, a white woman, and uh, he filed suit and prevailed in court. And in 1963, the, uh, the state of Nebraska finally repealed the law, and so now that Nebraska can live up to its motto, equality before the law. My parents got married in 1919. My father was an Irish immigrant, and he had not yet uh, become a citizen of the United States. My mother was three quarters Cherokee. So uh, they, uh, she did not know, but at that time, in a, when a, an American woman married a person who was not a citizen of the United States, she automatically renounced her citizenship. But it didn't matter because she couldn't vote anyway. Well, finally, when uh, women's suffrage was uh, enacted, she decided that she would vote. But her brother was a lawyer, said, no, you can't. You, you are not a citizen. So that meant that she had to go down to the courthouse in Denver and go before the judge. And the judge said, when he was talking to the new immigrants, he said, some of you have been in this country just a short time, but we have one woman here whose ancestors were here to greet the Mayflower. Well, she uh, uh, went home and she told my dad that she had become a citizen, and he said he was so relieved because he was sick and tired of being married to a foreigner. Thanks for joining me today, Mom, and talking about Native Americans and voting. Well, you're welcome, and I really enjoyed it. The photograph depicted is a picture of my grandmother and great uncle. This image reminds me that despite the government's failure to abide by the treaties they signed with tribal nations, my ancestors did not relinquish their belief in the power to change their lives over their communities by participation in a democratic process. If you would like to help ensure Native Americans do not again lose their voting rights, visit civicnebraska.org and become a voting rights advocate or scan the QR code on the screen. You too can join the long march forward for voting rights.